the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. It's Ebro Laura Rosenberg back on our program. Nicole Hannah Jones, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner, the New York Times Magazine best selling author, writer, uh, uh, professor at Howard University now. I mean, Nicole Hannah Jones, how are you today? I'm great. How are y'all? Well, phenomenal. Good to see you. Now, now, Nicole, we've had a number of conversations with you. You, 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 uh, your accolades and your resume has continued to shine and, and, and get things added to it. And I notice when I interview you often and we have conversations, I try to bring that, the person that I follow on Instagram out into the interview. <laughs> You know what I mean? The the woman making soul food and the woman hanging out in bed <laughs> Brooklyn with her family. You know, what is it? Bourbon is your drink? Yes. Drinking bourbon. Yes. Yeah. You know, the sneakerhead. Y'all, y'all know she's a sneakerhead, too. Nice. Oh, really? Yeah. Her sneaker game is official. <laughs> Always got some dunks on or something. Is that your is that your sneaker of choice? No, my, Jordans are my sneaker of choice, and mm. particularly uh, the 11s and the 1s. But, you know, I like sneakers in general, so. Wow, okay. What is your what is your most coveted pair of Jordans, Nicole Hannah-Jones? Mm. Mm-mm-mm. What would be my most coveted pair of Jordans? The ones you're um, like, yo, I'm only, I only wear these on special occasions. I'm not bringing these out too often. I don't really have a special occasion, Jordan. I'm not one of those those sneakerheads who just keeps the shoes in the closet. I I love to wear mine all the time, it. but I do try I, I all the time. It. But I do try to keep them clean. Um, but right now, I, I wear these. There's these newsprint Jordan ones that just speak to me. I wear those quite a bit. So they're the newsprints. Red, yeah, red I love those. And black, right, and and have a bunch of Jordan front pages on them. So I like. Oh, those. I haven't seen those. But yet. I also have these yeah, that- um, these glitter. These white and silver glitter um, 11s that I love. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a, a particular favorite. Now, um, how shocked are you? I guess not shocked. Shock's probably not the right word, but let's just go with happy. Elated are you of the performance and the sales of the 1619 Project book right now? I'm really excited. I mean, um, this is a book that is about slavery and about an issue um, that we haven't really wanted to address. So to have it be the number one uh, book in the country two weeks in a row so far is just amazing, uh, especially considering what's happening with all of these laws being passed across the country, trying to prohibit the teaching of the project by name. Georgia, um, Florida, Texas have all barred teachers from teaching the 1619 Project in those states. So to see Americans really uh, refusing to succumb to that has is, is been really powerful for me. Well, well knowledge is power, as we all have heard our whole lives. And so if they can prohibit you from getting the information, uh, they could prohibit you from having the power, which is which is always no is always how I know a book's official and the truth when elected officials in former you know confederate states don't want you to get your information yeah and it, it's not just the former confederacy we're seeing these laws being introduced in you know places that don't even have that many black people like south dakota um right. we're seeing these laws being considered in places like michigan i mean my own home state of iowa uh which clearly not in the Confederacy, first tried to ban the 1619 Project and then uh, banned, you know, this critical race theory, uh, which includes the 1619 Project. So what we're really saying, and I agree with you, you don't try to ban something unless you don't think you can make a stronger argument, because otherwise you just make a a stronger argument. So um, Americans in general, I think, don't like being told what they can or can't, uh, shouldn't read. Um, And so Americans are are not uh, submitting to it. Nicole, when you I mean, put it out does this book to the power of journalism, right? Like, I certainly didn't think I would create something that would be considered so dangerous that everyone from Donald Trump to uh, elected officials at the state level would be trying to keep it from uh, being read. When you first put out this book, who was one of the first people to call it controversial and to attack you for it? Uh, I mean, when uh, when the project first published two years ago in magazine form, it was kind of, you know, the standard uh, folks. Tom Cotton, Senator Tom Cotton um, was one of the first to introduce uh, legislation against it. Um, you had everyone from 
Donald Trump to uh, Senator or not, excuse me, um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. So it, it, it's, it's been kind of crazy in that way that some of the most uh, important Republican officials have spent a lot of time trying to bring the project down. And then there was also a couple months after we published a small group of historians who many would consider to be progressive, who also didn't like challenging the narrative of the American Revolution and who need to believe that this country is exceptional and, and founded uh, by demigods, apparently. And so we've also seen um, some people uh, criticizing the project from the left as well. So the the story that, of course, struck a lot of us, Nicole, was what happened with your tenure uh, at UNC or lack thereof. Um, for people who don't know, um, everyone expected that you would be offered uh, tenure there which is when a professor is able to stay at a school for as long as they want. They essentially have the job for life. And with all your accomplishments, it seemed like something that would have happened. It wasn't offered. Of course, you turned it, you turned lemons into lemonade, and now you're at Howard, which is amazing. But can you take us through what that was like? Were you surprised? Uh, just take us through the emotions of that whole experience. Sure. So, I uh, one, I, I'm, I'm a graduate of the University of North Carolina's journalism program. Uh, before I was denied tenure, University had just inducted me into the North Carolina Media Hall of Fame for my journalism. And this particular position uh, was designed to bring professional practitioners into academia. And every other professor in that position uh, was granted automatic tenure. And I had more qualifications, more experience, more awards than any of those prior um, chairs and also was the only the first black person who would have held that particular chair. So I would say I was both surprised and not surprised. I also knew that uh, the, the board of trustees that approves tenure uh, had gotten very right wing. I knew that there were efforts to lobby against me. Uh, I didn't know how much, which would later come out. So I, I knew that Republicans had really been trying to discredit me and my journalism since I published the 1619 Project. But because every other, I mean, we couldn't find a single other time where the university had recommended someone for tenure and the board had declined to grant that tenure. So that was surprising. But these are the times that we're in. You know, Republicans are always talking about cancel culture, but they're the ones who are actually using the levers of the state um, <laughs> to try to cancel people who have ideas that they don't like. Am I am I ignorant for thinking that even though it's North Carolina, I mean, th this is jesse helms state this is there's been a lot of bad politics in north carolina forever up until now but am i ignorant for thi like being surprised because i guess i didn't understand that people like that wielded power in academia because i i think of academia as being such a progressive place and i think of unc chapel hill as being such a great school is it is it silly that i'm surprised by that no, and, and honestly, North Carolina for a long time was considered a, a fairly progressive Southern state, um, but it's really had its governance overtaken by the same wave of right wing uh, officials that we've seen overtake the state houses and the governorships across the South and, and in certain parts of the Midwest. So yes, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill as a as a university is very progressive and it's, a, it's in an extremely progressive part of the state. But the Board of Trustees is appointed by the state legislature and the state legislature uh, is is very right wing overall. And so they have put nearly all Republicans on that Board of Trustees. And they're often in conflict because the Board of Trustees don't actually represent the people and the faculty of the university. And they've, you know, this isn't the first thing they've done. They really they closed the Civil Rights Law Center that was there. They defunded mm -hmm. the um the poverty law center that was there. Uh, there was the Silent Sam issue where, you know, they they basically got rid of the chancellor because she refused to put the monument back up to the Confederate uh, soldier. And they ended up paying two million dollars to let a uh, Confederate group take over that monument. So that I got caught in the middle of an ongoing conflict between this very conservative, very white board of trustees and a very liberal, much more diverse university. Mm. Um, speaking of schools, um you know, there's much made of critical race theory and it's not really taught in schools um, and, and definitely not public schools uh, and definitely not anywhere that, you know, um, it's, it's not until you get into law and higher education that you in, if, in, in elect to uh, encounter critical race theory, unless, of course, you're going by the book and you want to read about it. Um, 
but I've asked you this before, but just for this conversation, can you articulate the difference between the 1619 Project and Critical Race Theory and also the ways they intersect? Sure. So, so one, let's, let's just be clear that the fact that we're all talking about critical race theory right now uh, just speaks to the success of a Republican propaganda campaign. Yep. As you said, educators were not teaching critical race theory. Critical race theory became this kind of scary boogeyman uh, in order to stoke white resentment during uh, the election. And, and honestly, uh, since the, the midterms, we haven't even heard hardly anything about critical race theory. Imagine that. Um, so, what critical race theory is, though, and, and I don't oppose critical race theory being taught to, uh, to K-12 students because That's all right. critical race theory says is that we had this civil rights movement that ended discrimination in the law. And yet 60 years out, black Americans still face disadvantage and discrimination across American life. And it seeks to answer why is that? And it set, argues, of course, that. That's because racism is structural. It's not about individuals. It is built into the systems of America. Now, that's the opposite of how um, Republicans have talked about critical race theory, because they have actually said critical race theory is about making individual white children feel bad uh, and calling them the oppressor, which is not what critical race theory is. Um, however, the difference between the 1619 and the critical race theory is the critical race theory is an the academic theory. Um, the 1619 Project is a work of journalism and history that actually looks at the history of this country and draws connections between what happened in the past to what is happening in our country right now. They're not the same thing, but certainly the project is informed by critical race theory because the project is trying to ask and answer the same question. Why do we have a country that we have and what role does race? and the legacy of slavery play in the country that we have. Uh, but it's nothing to be afraid of, but it, um, you know, race is the oldest wedge issue in America. And we know that conservatives have long used race uh, to stoke tensions and to drive white voters to the polls. Um, you, you tweeted um, a couple of weeks ago with regard to, you know, people in America want to celebrate all of the great things in America without and specifically white people want to celebrate all the great things in America without any burden of holding on uh, of responsibility to the bad things that took place. And and can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I find that to be very true where everyone wants to uh, take credit for, uh, you know, uh, buy into this idea of American exceptionalism but never wanting to deal with the traumas and scars of the past and all of our, I think in many cases, but mostly white Americans role in holding on to behaviors and conditioning of the past that play a role in the way we interact with one another today. Absolutely. So, you know, Ebro, every black person gets this question multiple times in their lives, which is slavery was a long time ago. Why don't you get over it? And when we try to talk about the fact that if you look at anything in this country, uh, there was just another article uh, the other day about a black family had to remove any traces of their blackness from their house. And when they did that, their appraisal went up by five hundred thousand dollars. Oh, yeah, I remember That's that. Right. So we know yeah. we can look in, you know, everything, incarceration rates, health care, um, cancer rates, infant mortality rates, poverty rates, uh, whether you have a, a well-funded school or not, all of these things are tracked by race and black people are at the bottom of all of those indicators. And that is because slavery is foundational to the United States. It is one of the oldest institutions in the United States. It lasted longer than almost any institution. We had slavery for 250 years and we followed that by 100 years of, of racial apartheid, right? So when we seek to explain, well, why, why do we see so much inequality in our society? Black people are told to stop being victims. Why do you keep bringing up the past? Um, but you don't hear that when you're talking about things that Americans think make them great. So when a white person tells me, well, my ancestors never owned slaves, then I say, yeah, your ancestors didn't sign the Declaration of Independence either. But you claim that, right? You want to take right. pride in, and you want to claim things that your ancestors didn't do or that they did do, but you didn't do. So I'm just arguing that if you're going to take great pride in things about this past that you think glorify the United States, then you also have to accept the burden of the terrible things that this country has done. We have to own all of that history and all of that kind of collective responsibility. And instead, I guess I, I just, 
I'm wants sorry, to Nicole. deny that. And it's OK. I'm just you know, it's it's you don't get to pick and choose either. You you get credit and take no pride in anything in this country or you have to own the good and the bad. I guess I just don't understand why this is so hard. Like I. It's like racism, white well, supremacy, responsibility. Well, I, but but specifically, you know, the people who complain about it so much. I mean, I guess the easy answer would be, Nicole, that they are just racist they are uncomfortable um with all things black and so this is just a manifestation of that but i i guess i just I, i'm constantly getting messages from from people who complain about white people who even point out these inequities and i i personally i want to live in america I choose to live here. I want to live here. I, I I recognize the terrible things. I recognize the good things. It's the place where my family is. It's the place I plan on living. I don't understand the dilemma of being able to say that I love this place and hate some of the things that have happened in this place. Why is this concept so challenging for people? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it, it's a question that I really try to answer in the preface to the, the 1619 Project book, which is most of us, I, I believe that there's a, a segment of white Americans who just don't care, don't want to know. It's not going to change how they feel about anything. But I don't think that's most. I think most of us just have been taught this history so poorly that we don't understand. Uh, and we've been taught this narrative of American exceptionalism that we're really indoctrinated in. Like we we believe that we're the greatest country uh, that the world has ever seen, that we're the freest country that the world has ever seen, that capitalism is the greatest economic system the world has ever seen. And so I think people have a very visceral reaction to those narratives being challenged. But what I found is um, it really comes from us not being taught this history very well. So if you haven't been taught very much about slavery, you know it existed, but you don't know how it was the linchpin of our economic success. You don't know how much our laws, our policies, our customs really informed by that. Then you say, well, my family came here with nothing and we managed to succeed. So what's wrong with black people? And I don't want to hear uh, that you guys are struggling because all people are struggling. So what this project tries to do is, is provide that basis of knowledge that most Americans are lacking and I think the response to the project shows that when people get that information, when they get that understanding of history, it does change their perspective. Um, and and that's, what, that's what we're seeing. I think people are just reacting to a, a history that we've been taught that doesn't actually explain our country, that makes it very hard to understand our country. And so we fill in the blanks um, with what mainstream media tells us. Uh, but most people, I think, are, are open to the knowledge they've just never received it i mean think about what you've been taught about any of this history uh in k-12 or if you watch movies which is where most of us get an understanding of history most of us aren't doing like i do and being a complete nerd and just reading history books all day um we get these things from the little bit we get in school and we get it from popular culture and that tells us a very different narrative of america and people get i think unsettled when that narrative is challenged Nicole, do you think, um, you know, we're living in a, in a time right now where there's an awakening around mental health, around abuse, um, around trauma and these terms um, and how they can affect not only you, but your generations, your, your offspring. And, and people are really trying to grapple with understanding uh, the ways in which we have not only been damaged by the, the system we live in, but the way we've hurt one another. Is there also a lack of understanding about the damage of slavery um, and in the context of America and how damaging it was for humans to be cut off from their language, their culture, each other, their children, their loved ones, uh, time and time again, uh, over and over and over again, killed, maimed, raped, all of these things. And, and it, and if you don't understand the ways that trauma can uh, be now uh, uh, woven into your DNA, uh, into your behavior and the ways that you protect yourselves and everything that you do, do you think there will become an awakening of the trauma and the damage and the abuse and the mental health issues that were passed down from slavery as well? Yeah, I mean, this isn't my particular area of expertise, but I certainly know that there has been a lot more uh, 
conversation about th that generational trauma, as well as research into that generational trauma that is helping us to better understand uh, the way that it is passed down, um, that, that trauma can be passed down physically and certainly mentally, and certainly we see uh, the manifestations oftentimes in our communities. Uh, I think that you can look at even with COVID and when COVID first, uh, when we first heard of COVID and we were told that it really was only killing older people. And then when we started getting racial data, we saw that particularly with uh, black Americans and also uh, certain Latino populations that at much younger ages, they were dying from COVID. Well, that's because of this thing called weathering, which uh, black people age, not you know physically because black don't crack, but our bodies, our bodies age faster than other groups because of carrying this trauma, because of the stress of, stress of the discrimination that black Americans face. And so that's why it was manifesting a disease that we thought was really only taking the lives of elderly, was taking the lives of a lot of younger black people because uh, that trauma and that stress ages us. Um, it weakens our immune system. It weakens our, our heart. Um, and, and I think we are having a better understanding of that. And that's why you see, for instance, uh, Black Americans have maternal mortality rates uh, that rival, I don't like to use the word the third world, but the underdeveloped world. Um, our numbers look like that of countries that don't have the wealth and the health care that we have. And mm -hmm. those um, those rates are the same, whether we are a poor black person or a wealthy black person, whether we are uneducated black person or educated black person. That is that is because of uh, physical trauma that is manifesting in our bodies uh, and also, of course, racism in, in the healthcare system. It's um, it's it's powerful. Um, and, and it's important, which is why we've been spending a lot of time talking about it on this program and giving away the literature, uh, where we balance that with shenanigans. I often make jokes. I don't know if people have told you, Nicole, on the morning show, we'll be giving away a book and I'll say, say, yo, say, yo, we ain't got no concert tickets to go with this. Cause uh, even Nicole Hannah Jones, the author of this book likes to kick it once in a while. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, but, but in that vein, and I've, and I've seen you talk about, you know, gathering uh, you growing up in Waterloo, Iowa, and how important it was uh, for family gatherings um, yes. because of the hard work that you saw your father and your mother doing and the community doing. And sometimes the only time the only outlet for joy was the family gathering um, concerts, music. You're a big music fan. Um, I'd love to hear your your insight on that, too, because when you're talking about weathering, we're talking about trauma and mental health, you know, black joy, black celebration. The reason we like to kick it and party so hard and have such a good time just making food and listening to music was because that was the only way that we could survive. Absolutely. And and to be clear, the, the 1619 Project is a popular history. So this is this is history for regular folks. This helps us to understand the world that we live in. And our lives as Black people have never just been struggle. It's never just been oppression. Uh, so much of what is included in the book are stories of resilience, of stories of joy, of stories of creation. You know, the only original Black, or excuse me, American music are Black forms of music, beginning with the sorrow songs, which became gospel, uh, to jazz, to blues, to hip hop. So in the midst of uh, all of this hardship, Black people have always found community and created beautiful things uh, in community. And certainly, you know, this is, I think, why it's nice to be able to follow someone like myself on, on Instagram so that you can see, yes, I do my scholarship. I work hard. Uh, I care a lot about um, the type of justice work that I do. But I'm also a human being and, and I throw parties and I like to go out and have a drink every maybe more than once a while. Um, no, I care about sneakers. I, <laughs> you know, it's like we, this is, we, what we fight for is the fullness of black life for us to be able to live our lives the same as anyone else can live their lives. And we have to take those moments of joy. You know, as you know, Ibra, I throw, uh, at least before COVID, I always threw these black genius parties. And yep. it's just where you get a bunch of black folks who work across different fields and different areas of the arts. And we, you know, fry chicken and we dance. And um, those spaces are what, to me, fortify us to keep in the struggle uh, for, for the liberation of, of all people in this country. And I would just like to point out for the audience, I got invited to a genius party, a black 
genius party, all right? <laughs> so no matter what y'all think about my intellect, I was in the, I, I got invited. Was was the rule, Nicole, that people everyone invited had to be a genius? Uh, I'm not gonna answer that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I know, I, Come on, I, Nicole. I, come through for me. <laughs> I mean, the party is right. It's a general celebration of, of the genius that can be found uh, throughout black communities in many different ways. Um, and, it, and it really is uh, just a chance for us to to get together, to dance and to celebrate yeah. uh, the many forms of genius. Because to, because in truth, um, the way that genius has been defined in this country has been to exclude so many people who come from marginalized communities to 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 say the genius can only present in you know can you do a, a long mathematical equation which many of us can do of course but <laughs> genius manifests in many ways and and I think when when you read the 1619 project you know the arguments that Black Americans are uh, the most ardent freedom fighters this world is ever, this country has ever seen that we're the perfectors of this democracy that we read those words truth and wrote we hold these to be hold these to be we uh, believe those words. We we equal. hold people accountable right. to those we words. We that, right? They, you know, he wrote the words, but he held people in bondage while he was writing those words. But black people's genius was to say, "Okay, you didn't mean this for us, but we're going to fight to make this for us and for all people." And we have to be able to recognize all of the different ways that genius manifests itself. Man, even back then, we was like, "Yo, you got the wrong one today, fam. You wrote we that remixing. down." Psh we were remixing even back then. We're like, okay, those, that 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 word didn't apply to us. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was actually a succession document. The document was not a liberation document. It was a document to say this is why uh, the colonies felt they needed to break off from England. But black people read that top stanza and said, oh, we're just gonna we're gonna forget all that other stuff you wrote. We're gonna take that top stanza and we're gonna say that this is a liberation document. So we were remixing from the beginning. Um, Nicole, you know, um, if anybody wants 1619 Project, um, we, we purchased our books from Word Books. Shout out to Word Books for uh, keeping us in supply and, and making it uh, able for us to ship these out to people's homes. Um, so shout out to y'all. Um, Nicole, the, uh, the 1619 Project also has the genius of poetry in it, um, where, where in, each, in each section uh, you have some poets also. Uh, with some with some amazing poetry and and yeah. also to um, talk about the other writers uh, that participated in the 1619 project. I know um, this is a creation of yours, but there's amazing other individuals who contributed also. Absolutely. I mean, when you pick up the book, uh, which, by the way, uh, please support your independent black booksellers. You can go to bookshop.org uh, backslash 1619 and find all of the black booksellers um, or at least a, a long list of black booksellers that are selling the book. Um, but the book is really a, a, a testament to uh, black greatness. There are the some of the greatest living writers, um, period, in this book. So as you said, there are there are essays, um, there's short fiction, there's poetry. So everyone from Terry McMillan uh, of Waiting to Excel fame to, to Mama Sonia Sanchez, uh, Claudia Rankin, Jason Reynolds, um, Lynn Nottage. I mean, when when you look at the list, I, I think we counted there's something like 12 Pulitzer Prize winners. Uh, I don't know how many National Book Award winners, five MacArthur geniuses amongst these writers. Uh, and it really is just an amazing part of the book. There's also original, um, there's archival photography. So every essay begins with a photograph of just a regular black person, no one famous, no one that you would know um, necessarily. And the photos uh, span the time of when photography was invented to all the way to the present day. And it's just a way to force you to pause before you start each essay and, and, and think about that everything you're going to read affected real human beings who had the same wants, dreams, ambitions as anyone else, but lived in a country that didn't allow them uh, to, to live up to those dreams and ambitions. And, and then really some of the greatest historians in America tackling subjects, you know, Carol Anderson and Emory on self-defense. Uh, we have Anthea Butler on the black church, uh, Wesley Morris, who's one of my colleagues at the Times, who's won two Pulitzer Prizes, has his music on essay or on music, or excuse me, has his essay on music. Uh, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, Michelle Alexander, who wrote the new Jim Crow. Uh, I just think people are going to be really astounded by uh, the breadth of writers and the breadth of subjects that this project um, 
includes. And I've, you know, I have a, I have a degree in African American studies. I've written about racial inequality and read this history for more than twenty five years. And I learned something literally on every page of this book. Um, go get it, sixteen nineteen project. And for the kiddies, um, there's a partner book if you want to buy for your kids this holiday. It's called Born on the Water. I actually, um, it's in Issa's room. Um, but um, talk about Born on the Water too briefly, which was a, a book for kids that you put out right before this dropped. Absolutely. So Born on the Water is a picture book, and uh, it is basically an origin story for Black Americans' dis- descendants of slavery. And we wrote this book because it's the book I wish I had when I was a child, when so many Black children uh, get asked to do an assignment to draw the flag of their native land and write an essay about their native land. And of course, our connection to any other land um, besides America was erased through the Middle Passage. And that's a very degrading experience for a Black child to go through. So this is a book that talks about our people in Africa before we were brought here. And then it talks about the new people that were formed through the Middle Passage and uh, teaches our children that we have a very long uh, and proud legacy and tradition that America is our native land and we have the right to claim it uh, and that we are the perfectors of this democracy. Uh, It was co-written between myself and Renee Watson, who's a children's book author, and the illustrations in the book are absolutely breathtaking. And those were done by Nicholas Smith. So I really... Um, really recommend that parents, I've been hearing from so many parents who were like, they, they've shared this book with their children and they've never had a book uh, that, that, that allowed their children to feel that sense of pride about their heritage uh, in this way. Amazing. Amazing. So buy them both. That's what I did. I copped them both. Uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, we love you. Keep going. Uh, and, and let us know. Also, I left a comment. I saw you post about, you know, you went to your, your hometown of Waterloo, Iowa, and were able to uh, do a book signing there and what that meant to you. Um, and then people started talking about bringing you to states that have banned the book. Yes. Um, and so I, I want to participate in that. You know, I left a comment saying, oh, Yo, you want to hit Nashville? You want to hit any of these towns? You know, I got ideas. To, so if you're watching this conversation and uh, you live in an area where they are not embracing the 1619 Project. Nicole wants to come to your town. We're going to get security, though, but she's coming. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Have a happy holiday. You know what I mean? Cook Thanks up something Nicole. for us and, and send send love to your daughter and your husband and everybody in Brooklyn over there with you. Absolutely. Everyone have a happy holiday as well.